The following program is a presentation of Grace Communion International and Grace Communion Seminary and is made possible by generous donations from viewers like you. On this episode of You're Included, theologian Jeff McSwain discusses sanctification and how Christ transforms us. Our host, is Dr. J. Michael Fizell. Jeff, thanks for joining us. Great to be here, Mike. Thank you. In Christ, we're a new creation, and yet we still sin. How is it that sanctification actually works in our lives? That's a great question, because I think one of the biggest struggles that we have is, well, if, I, if I'm already a new creation, then why do I sin the way I do, maybe even worse than I did before I became a Christian? Mm. The other side of that coin is, what about people who aren't Christians, who seem to live lives that are more Christian than Christians? <laughs> what about people who seem to exhibit more fruit of the Holy Spirit that aren't Christians? Where does that come from? Uh, so it's both, it's both it's two sides of the same coin. Where, where do the bad things in Christians' lives come from? And where do the good things in unbelievers come from? It's really, it's really a, a very practical question. I think it's one that confuses young people tremendously. As I've said before, when they go to a camp experience and when they're told that because they've made a decision for Christ, they're a new creation. The old has gone the new has come. And they really do feel that way when they leave the mountaintop. When they go home, however, then life hits them hard. And they begin to wonder, oh man, was that, was that his brainwashed at camp? Was, what was that good feeling that I had? I don't feel like a new creation at all. I feel worse than I ever did. What's going on there? Well, to go back to that passage in 2 Corinthians where Paul talks about a new creation, and this is something that we've mentioned before, that whole passage is very, very uh, universal in scope. And I, I, I hesitate to even say the word universal because people often take that to the next step of universalism. But no, this is the idea that every single person is implicated in what Christ has done. That, and, and the passages. That 2 Corinthians 5 passage where he talks about new creation in verse 17, right before that, He'd been talking about how everyone is implicated in the death and resurrection of Jesus Christ. And from now on, we look at no one from a human point of view. We always look at people now through the perspective uh, of Christology and who we know Jesus Christ to be. And because of that, we can know that everyone has a sinful side to their lives, not just unbelievers, or, or, but also Christians. We can know that that's still there, but we can also know that there's been something that has been done about that in the death and resurrection of Christ that has eradicated all sin and made us pure, holy, and blameless in the sight of God. But how do those two things fit together? Uh, that's the question. The first point, though, I think is, is worth repeating, and that is this is true uh, for everyone. This pattern of, of the two things going on in the same space is not a linear one at all. Oftentimes we think of it as linear. Uh, I was an old creation, now I'm a new, and the old is gone. So it, it's a replacement of the old with the new. Anytime we think about this as just a replacement of the old with the new, all we have is the new. We have no way of interpreting any of our sinful n nature or any of our sinfulness anymore because we've said the old is gone. So how do we, how do we get bad out of good? Um, we've got to be able to see that those two things are happening in the same space. And they're happening in the same space for every human being. However, by the Holy Spirit, who lifts us up to live into our, our, our life with Christ and allows us, hopefully, to manifest the fruit of the Spirit in, in a, a more o overt or in a, in a more manifest way than an unbeliever most of the time, uh, we can see that the Holy Spirit really works to bring out 
as we work out our salvation in fear and trembling, the Holy Spirit works to allow us to grow into the person that we already are. But the key to understanding those two things, Mike, that go on in the same space is Christology. It goes back to the Council of Chalcedon, or Chalcedon, whichever way you'd like to pronounce it, in 451. I think I did read the book Fahrenheit 451 a long time ago. I don't remember what that was like, but I thought about writing a book that's called uh, Christology 451 or Humanity 451. It has to do with this theological anthropology of how we look at human beings from a Christ-centered perspective. You don't need to go any farther than a few verses down to see how it is accurate to say that those two things, our sinfulness and our purity, can be put in the same space because we have to look no farther than Jesus Christ Himself. That passage says, He made Him who had no sin to be sin so that in Him we might become the righteousness of God. What that passage says, and it really packs a wallop, is that Jesus Christ never lost His divinity and His deity and His purity in the Incarnation, but He became sin. How can those two things fit together? I've always been taught that a holy God couldn't touch sin. I've always been taught that sin and holiness are two completely different categories. But this passage explodes that completely and says, yes, they are two different categories, but instead of it being a dualism, it's a duality. It's two natures in one person. That is the Christology of Chalcedon. Two natures. Christ assumed our corrupt, depraved humanity, and He always remained God, pure and holy and unblemished the whole time. And somehow, in the one person of Jesus Christ, those two things exist in the same space. And, and you know, the whole idea of the atonement and, and the idea of substitutionary atonement sometimes falls prey to a Christology that is, is not orthodox, according to the, the earliest creeds. And what I mean by that is, they'll say, well, in order for Jesus Christ to become sin, He must have had to take a few days off, at least, from being God. <laughs> There's no way that He can be sin and be God at the same time because they come into the whole thing with this presupposition that the two cannot exist in the same space, and therefore there's a mutual exclusivity there that if God became sin, He must have stopped being God. And of course, that's bad Christology, but in turn, it's also bad anthropology because of what Christ has done for all of us. Well, a lot of times the idea is that Christ uh, became human in the sense of Adam before the fall, so that his humanity is, um, is untouched mm -hmm. or untainted, uh, perfect humanity. Mm -hmm. Well, to say it that way, of course, the church fathers would turn over in their grave because for them, the unassumed was the unhealed. And if Christ uh, assumed a perfect humanity, then how could he redeem it, what didn't need to be redeemed? Uh, he had to grab onto us and really grab onto us or else this whole thing just becomes a transaction that occurs over our heads somewhere and never really touches us. But the fact is, He grabbed onto us and plumbed the deepest depths of our sinfulness. Uh, I mean, this is all solved in, in, by the church in the Apostles' Creed. He descended into hell, the Creed says. We have to know that He embraced us at our worst that He became us. Even Martin Luther would say, He became the greatest sinner of all. Why did Jesus have to die? Because He was a sinner. This uh, people can't take because they don't think of those two things as being able to happen in the same space. Not because He sinned Himself, but because He took our sinfulness, because our sinful nature. He took our sinful himself. nature in a way that was even more perfect and more deep than we even take our own sinful nature, or that we even fall prey to our sinful nature. He does everything more perfectly than us. And that, that helps because we know there's no residue, there's nothing below our sinful nature that hasn't been touched by Jesus Christ that He became 100% sin. He became sin. He was made to be sin, it says. That, that doesn't minimize in the least anything about Him becoming something like sin or 
He associated himself with sinners. No, this is even deeper. This is he became sin, 100% sin. Now, he was also 100% God the whole time. And thankfully, 100% God is deeper than 100% sin. <laughs> Otherwise, we'd be in real trouble. But the point is that he reached down. I remember Gary Detto, one of my mentors, telling me this. I love this, this, this picture. He reached down into the sock, all the way to the very tip of the sock, and pulled it inside out. He didn't reach halfway down the sock uh, or somehow touch the sock and zap it but, or do a transaction above it that somehow paid a penalty. But he actually, the doctor became the patient. He dived down into the very deepest part of our sinful, corrupt humanity, grabbed onto us there and pulled, pulled us out inside, pulled hell inside out. It's funny because people say, you know, Jeff, sometimes they'll say, you don't take, her you don't take hell seriously enough. <laughs> and I'll say, well, you might be right, but maybe you don't take Christ seriously enough. Because, as I said before, hell, sin, death, and the devil have been defeated. Now, now, how do we translate what happened in Jesus Christ and his assumption of our fallen, corrupt nature? How do we translate that into good theological anthropology for us as human beings? And getting back to that sanctification question is, is the next step to that. Uh, I think that we uh, are not God. We talked earlier at breakfast about the fact that to be adopted by God does not it is good language. It's a metaphor. It has its shortcomings. It's like all metaphors. But it has its strengths in that we are not God. We are adopted by God to be in His family. But we get to share fully in the Trinitarian life of God, and we get a full inheritance as sons. But as Peter says later in, in the epistles, we get to participate in the divine nature. But we ourselves are not of the divine nature, intrinsically and inherently, by right. We are not God. But we get folded into that by the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ. And because of that, we are, we are sons and we are daughters of God. We are really given. We really are pure and holy sons of God. And we, we really are not like Jesus, but he is actually sharing his real sonship with us. And so we, we do participate in the divine nature. We do have the indicative of grace, but, but we share in God's nature by grace and not inherently. And at the same time, we also know we're fully sinful in our old man, in our old selves. And we are one person. So in the same way, the two natures in one person pattern of Chalcedon is a definition of our humanity. The only difference is that our divinity, so to speak, and the old deification idea is not that we become God, but that God has become man to share His divinity with us in such a way that, that our divinity, so to speak, as sons of God is by grace, nothing intrinsic. But still, we are, we are really sons of God, and I think that doesn't really sink in a lot of times. Well, we us. use the term already, but not yet. Mm -hmm. And it's like we focus more on the but not yet than on the already. Mm -hmm. And that's because we're creatures of habit who walk by sight instead of walking by faith. When Paul says in that passage in 2 Corinthians 5, we no longer look at anyone from a human point of view, what he's saying there is there's been uh, a change in thinking. We have a new framework now. We, we have repented. Metanoia is a radical change of mind. Let's say this is our fallen human selves, uh, and we used to look at ourselves like this, and we saw our sinfulness, and we saw our shame, and we saw our guilt. And maybe Christ adds on to that somewhere, but we, he's kind of secondary, he's kind of incidental, he's kind of accidental, and maybe we can be like him someday, and we're trying to get better, and we're trying to be sanctified and to grow toward uh, being more Christ-like. But it all really starts from looking at ourselves first and foremost as fallen, sinful uh, people. But instead, this, this repentance is to look at it from the other side and say, yes, this horizontal aspect of, of this duality, you know, this horizontal kind of describes our flat line, our, our death, our, 
our uh, incompetence, our uh, futility and bankruptcy uh, as sinners. Uh, the wages of sin is death. And yet, now we look at no one from that point of view. We look at everyone through Jesus Christ and we see that, yes, we are all wicked, but we are righteous in Christ. And so, repentance is to, is to turn in your thinking to look at everyone as if Jesus Christ applies to us all. And what that allows us to do is move past the zero-sum game of sanctification. I don't know if you've ever heard people say this before, but they'll say, you know, sanctification is kind of like John the Baptist, who's, uh, his saying of, I must decrease and he must increase. Well, again, if we think of that in a linear way, it's kind of like a football field, and the team's marching down the football field, and they get to midfield, and they get to the 40-yard line, 30-yard line, 20-yard line, and we're trying to get to be more Christ-like, which would be to cover all the whole distance. Uh, but then we fall back, and we slide back, and we get pushed back into our own end of the field. And we're, we're constantly going back and forth, and it's a zero-sum game, you know, where we 60% like Christ and 40% not. Uh, maybe we fall back to 30% maybe fall back to 20% and 80% uh, needs to be improved on. And it's this sliding scale of sanctification, and we think that we're trying to get to a place that we're not already. The beautiful thing about the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, and as is patterned in the Chalcedonian formula, is that we're already there. We are 100% pure and holy, without blemish, free from accusation, seated with Christ in the heavenly realms as sons and daughters of God. That has already taken place, not because of anything we've done, but because of what Christ has done. Now, if we start with that as the baseline, then all of a sudden, instead of trying to minimize our sin or manage it, we can actually see how heinous it is. To me, this is one of the great keys of sanctification for us as believers in the economy of grace. We can actually give ourselves permission to say, wow, I really am uh, wicked in many of my motives. I, I, really am, I really am bankrupt. I really struggle with original sin. I really, I really am tempted in ways maybe now that I wasn't tempted before. But what we're allowing ourselves to do is to start with the starting point of total grace and from within that to be able to see our total depravity. But to talk about total depravity outside of total grace will destroy us, absolutely. And that's why Karl Barth and the Torrances of others have always wanted us to know that God's no to humanity was always inside of the larger yes. But our, our, our solidarity with Adam and our solidarity with Christ fit in the same space. So, and what Karl Barth does, and this is beautiful in, in Church Dogmatics 3, book 2, he actually takes Frederick or Friedrich Nietzsche, and folds him into his own program on anthropology. Because, you know, Nietzsche's whole outlook on humanity was dismal, hopeless, futile, absolutely abysmal. And it paints a terrible picture of the darkness of the human race. And Karl Barth says, just to take what Nietzsche says and to apply it in a vacuum is... is is destructive. But if we understand total grace and that we are a hundred percent there already, we can allow ourselves then see, gosh, I'm a hundred percent sinful too. I, I am I am wicked. I don't know if any anything that I ever do has a pure motive. I I know that I am a mixed bag. And we see this all the time. We think, wow, these are great Christian men who seem to fall, a congressman who has a lot of influence, or a person who leads a Christian camp, who abuses kids, or a person who leads someone to Christ even when they're cheating in an adulterous affair. What is going on there? It's so confusing. And yet, if we can know that those solidarities with Adam and with Christ are there, we'll actually have greater victory over that solidarity with Adam because grace always outruns sin. Sin never trumps grace. Sin never gets the upper hand. But we allow ourselves to see just how bad sin is. And that's why it just kills me when people say Karl Barth is soft on sin. Because 
Soft on sin means to play this zero-sum sanctification game where we actually think we're marching down the field and becoming more like Christ and becoming less sinful. That's the most proud, haughty, pharisaical way of thinking that there is. And religion is the great opiate. It allows us to be able to rationalize our sinfulness and think we're not that bad. Karl Barth says, no, we're, we're bad. God had to come and die on a cross. Well, if we're very honest with ourselves, <laughs> it's frustrating anyway because we, we know we never actually make progress. Right. And if we do make progress, we do lose it. Right. And we get nowhere because we, we never actually get to the finish line, to the goal. And, and to be able to say, I am moving toward the finish line because Christ has carried me across the finish line is a beautiful way of thinking. I am going to make it across the finish line because I have made it across the finish line. It's sanctification really depends on starting with the end in mind. It really comes down to believing that we're home before we start. That's Paul, Paul always, when he gives these so-called sin lists or tells us, right. gives admonition about right living, right. he always starts from, here's who you already are, therefore uh, act like it, therefore behave this way. Not, right. not if you behave this way, then you'll become the child of God, right. but you're already a child of God. This right. is who you are, therefore uh, start living like it. Oh yeah, well 1 Corinthians 5 and 6 is a perfect example of that. When, when Paul is talking about church discipline and he's saying, you know, expel the immoral brother, expel the wicked brother from among you. But he's just told the whole church that they are of the unleavened bread, that they are holy and pure, that they should think in rightness and in truth about who they are. And so there's an accountability to grace. The whole reason Paul doesn't want that person to be in the church at that particular time is because he's holding that person to grace. And one of the greatest disservices that I think we could do would be to exercise church discipline without the discipline of Chalcedon, without the discipline of the indicatives of grace. Theologically, we've got to be disciplined enough to give everyone the indicative. This man is pure and holy and blameless. Therefore, we can call out the sinfulness of his behavior in our own and say, that doesn't belong anymore. That doesn't fit. That is not in correlation with truth. And we're not going to pretend that it is in correlation with truth. He needs to go learn his lesson and then come back. The indicative, however, for Paul is never in question, not even with the wicked man, because then Paul goes down through that list of sins. And who could stand up under that? Idolaters will not inherit the kingdom of heaven. Adulterers will not inherit the kingdom of heaven. Well, we've all been idolaters and, and adulterers in, in Jesus' definition. And so is this some kind of sliding scale of liars will not inherit the kingdom of heaven, but as long as you don't lie too much. <laughs> or, you know, uh, what it means by idolater is somebody who practices it a lot. Well, where is that point? Where is that point where you become an idolater instead of just falling prey to idolatry once in a while? The fact is we're all... And I can say this because I believe in the total grace of our Lord Jesus Christ. We're all idolaters. We're all adulterers. Thank God that adulterers will not inherit the kingdom of heaven. Thank God that that adulterous Jeff McSwain has been crucified with Christ and no longer lives. In the ultimate scheme of things, he doesn't have a future. And, and thankfully, I don't have to define myself that way anymore. So I can actually give full play to my sinfulness and say, thank God that doesn't inherit the kingdom. Thank God Jesus Christ has taken care of that. Thank God that grace is a slaying grace. That I have been crucified with Christ. That, that when Christ died, I died. And so did all of us. And we've been given a new life. To think about it from that perspective. The very fact Christ, the very fact that we are that way is right. why Christ came and is what the gospel is all about. That's why the gospel is good news, mm -hmm. uh, because he's done something about that fact. And that good news is not some kind of sloppy permissiveness. It's not some like, okay, well, I'll just forgive you and you're off the hook. It, it's an accountability. Grace, because Christ is our life, sin would be to say, no, he's not, but he is our life. He's living our life for us, and there's an accountability to that grace. There's an account. We have to hold each other to grace, Mike. In our church, that's what that whole passage on church discipline is about. I'm going to hold you to grace. I'm not going to let you pretend like this is not true about you. And so it all comes down to how we view everyone 
in the church and out of the church, but the church is the group of people who want to, to live into this reality. They want to help each other and hold each other accountable. And so if, if I knew that somebody in my church was involved in pornography, I wouldn't go and say, you know, I'm not sure you're saved. I wouldn't go to him and say, I'm not sure that, you know, that you should be coming to church until you change your behavior. I would say to that person, listen, this is not of Jesus Christ. Christ is your life. This is not of Christ. And, and if he, and I would hold him accountable to grace. It gives us a higher ethic than the law. Well, in, in, uh, in Titus, Paul is writing to uh, Titus and he says, it is grace that teaches us to say no to ungodliness. Yes. And, and what a totally different perspective. We're, it, the very fact <laughs> right. of our desire to say no to ungodliness doesn't come out of saving ourselves and trying to work out our, our salvation and, and, and get salvation. It mm -hmm. comes out of the fact that we already have grace, live in grace, right. are under grace. Therefore, that's right. That passage, it starts out with, again, the comprehensive view of humanity. The grace of God has appeared, bringing salvation to all. It yeah. teaches us to say no to ungodliness. And then later in that same passage, he says, the whole point of this is that you might be eager to do what is good. Yeah. You're motivated by grace. So if I'm holding someone to grace and they say, forget that, I don't want to listen to that, don't tell me that, everybody's a sinner, I'm forgiven, I'll do whatever I want to do, then mm. that is not the economy of God. Yeah. That's some kind of sloppy permissivism, permissivism, it's some kind of just slapping some forgiveness onto sin and God saying yes to our sin. He's never said yes to our sin. I've had yet to, in spite of the fact that that's often used as a, you right. know, an attack against what you're talking about grace too much. I've never met somebody that actually says that. Right. Who who actually believes? Well, I can do whatever I want because I'm under grace. Yes. Our, the, the spirit of God in us doesn't let us even think like that. Alan Torrance has a good line about that. He talks about how in the prodigal son story. Uh, when the son comes back and the penny drops for him that he's unconditionally loved and accepted and has always been a son in his father's eyes and he comes home to the feast that can you imagine that son after that encounter with his father that day saying oh great now I can go back out to the brothel yeah exactly it, it's uh, that's it, not the it's way nonsense th that's yeah. a misunderstanding of grace and that's why Paul says by no means does that mean you just go out and do whatever you want to do? But Karl Barth gets us back to this very helpful way of thinking about Chalcedon when he says, in, in, in regards to the already but not yet, because the already but not yet goes both ways. The old man has already been crucified, but not yet. We are already seated with Christ in the heavenly realms, but not yet. Uh, those two things, are, they go both ways. And so Karl Barth says, I was and still am the old man. I am and will be the new man. He gets those asymmetrical, those solidarities there, but he always wants us to know that they're asymmetrical. One has a future, one doesn't. Mm -hmm. One by the Holy Spirit, we may and can live in now, even though our lives are in this matrix of a mixed bag of righteousness and wickedness, we may live as righteous sons of God by the Holy Spirit now, who he lifts, the Spirit lifts us up to live into our true selves and gives us the ability, therefore, to call our old false selves what they are. Paul says, uh, we, in 1 Corinthians 13, we see in a glass darkly in the old King mm -hmm. James, it, it, a poor image right. as in a mirror. But then he talks about how what we really are is what we're having trouble seeing. Even us seeing our true selves as he's made us to be. Mm -hmm. But he says the time is coming when we will uh, see ourselves as we really are. That's right. That distortion is, is there because we think of our own sinfulness in a sinful way. <laughs> and we can't, only by the revelation of God can we, can we really see him and ourselves as we really are. And we have to keep reminding each other of that. That's why this whole thing is corporate from beginning to end. Uh, what must I do to be saved? Well, be saved because you are. How do I do that? How do I do that? I want to know how, how, how. Well, let's do it together. Let's just celebrate it. Let's pretend like it's true. Let's keep thanking God over and over and be grateful for what He's done. And let's rub in the ointment of grace. And pretty soon we'll begin 
to have the mind of Christ which we have been given to think about ourselves more accurately but not only that to think about everybody else in the world more accurately yeah. I was and still am the old man I am and will be the new man it's such a clear mm -hmm. perspective to hold on to right You've been watching You're Included, a production of Grace Communion International.